These guys, this generation, they've been snapping up records left, right and centre, but you still have a few. Those 109 titles, that remains a record. You've got the number of match wins record. Are you protective of those records? Are you keeping an eye on the ones mm -hmm. snapping no, your No, but I want to answer you this. Whenever there's a, a, a record broken, whose is it? Jimmy Connors. Well, <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then for me, that, you know, if, if they're chasing what I did, and in my accomplishments, then you know what else you know can I ask for? I mean, you know. there is a town where the assembly line mentality does not exist, where craftsmanship is revered, where precision is a way of life. A town where the largest occupation is that of car maker. The town is Kalmar, Sweden the only place in the world where this car could be built. The new Volvo 760. Hi, I'm Jimmy Connors. This is the second in a two-volume set of videos called Jimmy Connors Tennis. The first volume concentrates on winning fundamentals. But in this tape, Match Strategy, I'm going to tell you how to put these skills into winning matches. cover a lot of strategy in this tape. How to return serve. The more difficult touch shots. And one of your favorites. I'll talk about playing doubles. As you know, I'm left-handed. I'll translate some of the shots for right-handers, but otherwise, you'll find reversing what I say quite easy. It's very easy to step up to a line and, and have the balls in your hand and, and think about what you're going to do. Uh, then it's just a matter of choosing which serve you're going to, uh, to throw in at the time. Got it. Got it. The flat serve is used uh, to be more aggressive when you're really going to go for it. You're going to throw the ball up, throw it out in front of you, and as you lean into the ball, hit very squarely across the ball so that the ball comes through the court with much more pace. The, the spin serve, or the slice serve, is used in a different situation, which is to more or less take your opponent off the court, uh, to open up the, the whole court for yourself so that you can take the advantage of hitting into an open space. Uh, the slice serve is not one used for a winner. It's one to just give yourself the advantage to hit into an open space and hopefully go ahead and win the point from there. The kick serve is mostly used to keep your opponent a little bit off guard, to mix it up a little bit so that he's not just standing there prepared to return either the flat serve or the slice serve. Uh, the kick serve bounces up, it's a little bit higher maybe a little bit difficult for uh, a lot of players to control and one that should be used uh, more or less at the right time. Now I'd like to show you uh, the best way to go about making these work for you. Uh, the slice serve, for instance, as you know, you throw a little bit out uh, to the left if you're left-handed and to the right if you're right-handed so that as you do, uh, your racket comes and brushes across the back of the ball so that as the ball leaves your strings, it's spinning in a motion 
to, as it hits the court, it continues spinning and, and continues on and goes away from your opponent? Well, as far as a slice serve goes, I don't think there's any uh, uh, better server in the game right now than, than John McEnroe, uh, or maybe ever. I think he, he along with his serve and, and the way he moved and, and volleyed at the same time, could be uh, one of the best serving volley players of, of all time. as compared to the flat serve, that as you toss the ball up in front of you, the racket comes through and meets the ball almost head on. So as the ball explodes off your racket, it hits the court and continues to go through with power and speed. As compared to the kick serve now, which for me, I throw a little bit to the right now, a little bit behind my head, so that as I do come up and meet the ball with my racket, my racket's coming from below the ball to the top, so that as the ball leaves my racket, it's spinning in a way that as it hits the court, the ball continues to bounce high and away. Well, the kick serve uh, is, is one that's really used uh, a lot when you're growing up. Uh, the players are, you're, you're younger, you're a little bit smaller, you haven't developed, so uh, it's a, it's a, one, it's a serve that you use to really clear the net and make sure you get the, the serve in the box to start the point. But unfortunately, uh, there's a player out there named Stefan Edberg who hasn't uh, quite realized that yet, but he's also added a little bit more to that as far as uh, making it one of the best serves in the game for him. He, on the other hand, has put a little bit more pace behind it and a little bit more spin on it to the point where it comes in more or less like a flat serve but has the bite of the kick serve on it. And with the way he moves in behind it and as big and as tall and as strong as he is, uh, makes him one of the best serving volleyers in the game also. 15. No. When you're ahead, I would suggest that you really go for it a little bit more. So the flat serve would be the one that you would go to. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, penetrating. It gives you the opportunity to uh, take the initiative right off the bat so that you put your, your opponent under a little more pressure. Uh, when you're behind, uh, the spin serve or the kick serve would probably be the one that you would use to maybe mix it up a little bit more, to catch your opponent a little bit more off guard, so that as you can work yourself into the point, you can get a little more accustomed to what he's going to do, the way he plays, and open the court up to your advantage. When you're ahead, use the flat serve. When you're behind, throw the ball in so that you can get into the point and hopefully work it from there. Every toss should be the same. Uh, that, that is part of the disguise of where you're going to hit the ball, I would think. Uh, then again, if you can accomplish that and you can get to the point where you feel that you can master the toss, where everyone is the same, then I would like for you to sit here and I'll be out there listening to you. Uh, but everybody's toss is different. Some are high, some are low. Some are a little bit further out in front, some are behind the head. It depends really on the kind of serve that you're, you're, you're going to go into. Uh, there's a flat serve, for instance, where the ball should be out in front of you to where you're really leaning in. Then there's the kick serve, where the ball is a little bit, for me, since I'm left-handed, the ball would go to the right of my head so that the racket comes across the ball to where I get the maximum amount of bounce. Then there's a slice serve, for me, being left-handed again, I throw the ball a little bit further out to the left of my body so that my racket comes around the ball and is slicing the ball so that when it hits, it continues traveling away from the opponent. Throughout my whole career, I was very content with just throwing in my serve, so to speak, in quotes, unquote, and, and letting the rest of my game take over from there. Uh, five years ago, I thought it better to change that to a point of trying to get a few free points here and there to where maybe I'd serve an ace or an unreturnable or they'd get a, give a weak return and I'd be able to, to take full advantage of it from the beginning. And I did that by one simple little plan. And that was just, as I tossed the ball, I made sure the ball was out in front of me a little bit more so that I could lean in and, and get my full body weight behind my serve so that I felt I was getting some pace on it. It shouldn't have been that major, but, but for me, uh, I tossed the ball to behind my head, which would have been to the right of my head all throughout my whole career, and was content about 
going for the, the maximum percentage of first serves and, and serving 85% first serves in. But I felt at this time or at this part of my career that I needed a few, a few free points here, one here, one there, and I took advantage of it, and that year I happened to win Wimbledon, and that was pretty exciting. Now, you think the game's going to serve and volleying more or less. Uh, the game has gone through a period of, of change from grass to clay and now to hard courts and, and slower indoor courts. So uh, the amount of serves that you have, the kick serve like Ed Berg, the slice serve like McEnroe, uh, are ones that are very useful on all surfaces, which I think now is very important since the game is, is going back to an all-around, all-court game. When you make it to the French and you're playing on the red clay courts, uh, it's a little bit slower. So it's important for you to be able to mix up your serves. The flat serve is not going to be as penetrating as you would like it to be because the court is a little bit slower and the ball bounces a little bit higher. Use your kick serve and your spin serve to mix it up to keep your opponent off guard. Then after you play the French and you make your way to the lawns of the All England Club for Wimbledon, I think it's much, uh, much more worth your while to use uh, the flat serve and the slice serve. The grass makes the ball stay lower. It takes the spin a little bit more so that it does move away from your opponent and it gives you an opportunity to use the open space to your advantage. Uh, on the hard courts uh, of the US Open and also indoors, I suggest that you just go ahead and mix up your serves to the point where you feel comfortable. Uh, the hard court is not as slow as the clay, it's not as fast and as low a bounce as the grass courts, so it gives you an opportunity to use all your serves, it really at any time, to the point where you feel that it, you're most comfortable and to your advantage. Choosing a serve is, is very spontaneous. You step up there, you look over the situation, and you do what feels best for you inside. Yeah, or you, you don't want to get into a pattern to where your opponent knows you're going to serve a flat serve all the time or a slice serve or a spin serve all the time. So it, you mix it up a little bit. Now it's just a matter of you making the right choice and hoping it works. When you're waiting for, for the return of the serve, you just, uh, you're preparing yourself really for what's to come. What is to come? Uh, I don't have the balls in my hand. Uh, I'm facing against someone who is uh, uh, one of the best servers in the game or, or whatever they are. All I want to do is be prepared or try to be prepared of what they're going to throw at me. Uh, that involves a, a, a number of things. I think most important is just being ready and being alert so that you're not afraid to, to jump on or to, to lean forward or, or to go forward and attack a ball no matter what they throw at you. Now, they're going to throw a slice serve or a spin serve or a flat serve or whatever it is. You just have to be prepared for it mentally and physically. And if you can do that, then whatever happens, happens. There's no real set program for returning the serve. It's just you against your, your opponent, your return against his serve, and let her go and see what happens. As far as standing uh, and waiting for the return of serve, I, I, I've always stood close to or, or right on the line, on the baseline, uh, which in one way is good because I'm able to take the ball as soon as the ball hits, which means takes the ball on the rise. Uh, on the other hand, you're giving away that split second of maybe seeing the ball a little bit, uh, a little bit closer, a little bit clearer. So if you want to step back a little bit, I'd, I'm not going to disagree with that. Uh, it gives you a little bit more of a chance to, to pick up the ball, see the ball, and get your racket back in time to make, hopefully, good solid contact. Reading a toss gives you an, an idea of what you're going to face. Uh, that's one thing that I've relied on a little bit over, over the course of my time, is trying to pick out uh, where, the, where my opponent is tossing the ball uh, to maybe give away one, one inch or one split second of, uh, of if he's going to serve a flat serve or a spin serve or whatever. Uh, if you can find that or you're lucky enough to be able to, to uh, pick that out, 
then, then you have to consider yourself very lucky. That's going to give you a little bit of an edge. The power in the return of serve uh, comes from really just getting the racket back and, and bringing the racket through and making good solid contact with a firm grip. Uh, the reaction time is so fast that to get the racket back and to say that you're going to put the ball here or put the ball there or hit it as hard as you want or whatever is, is very difficult to, to do. Uh, you're in reaction time, so your basics have to come through for you here. The getting the racket back, holding a good, firm, solid grip, and making good, solid contact with the ball, hopefully out in front of your body, uh, is important. Because things are happening so fast, sometimes you're in a position of only blocking the ball back or just getting by with holding just a good firm grip and letting the racket do all the work. Uh, it's difficult to, for me to sit here and to say, you have to get your racket back, you have to meet the ball in front of you, you have to continue following through and you're hitting the ball down the line because that just doesn't happen. You're, you're, hap you're working so hard and things are happening so fast that sometimes the worst habits come through to make the best shots. But you have to do what it takes within yourself and knowing that you have the good solid basic foundation, but also working within yourself to do what it takes to be able to change a little here, change a little there to make things work while you're playing. And if that doesn't work, can't hit you. <laughs> When you're facing against a, a player who is hot and serving well, and uh, it's very important to, to keep a good positive mental attitude, uh, you have to feel that no matter what they're doing, they have to keep it up for X amount of time. Uh, what is that X amount of time? Uh, it's at least two sets. Uh, the longer you keep them out there, the better off you are to the point of uh, maybe they'll cool off a little bit. Maybe they'll miss a first serve here. Maybe they'll miss a shot there. That that gives you a, an opportunity to, or, or a, yeah, an opportunity to, to, to get in there and make you feel like you're able to accomplish something. Uh, when you're facing someone who is just blitzing you off the court, serving aces and, and unreturnables, it's important to, number one, stay in there, don't get discouraged. I know that's tough to do. Uh, I've hung my head once or twice myself, but if you can keep your head up, uh, Keep what you have in mind on your mind. Don't ever lose track of what you're doing. Uh, make sure that you're looking at the ball, trying to see the ball as clearly as you can. Hold a good solid grip, and above all, attack. I've enjoyed the return of serve. I've enjoyed having that be one of the best parts of my game. I learned that not uh, by practicing it or, or going out and having uh, a conscious mental note of really how I wanted to go about it, but I learned it on uh, very, very fast varnished wood uh, on a National Guard armory, and uh, I had to attack the ball and take the ball on the rise as I do. Uh, if not, the ball would have slid away from me on this very fast wood. So uh, I learned from a very, very young age to attack uh, the serve and to catch the ball on the rise, and it stuck with me throughout my whole career. Uh, I'm happy that it did. I've enjoyed returning the ball like this. It, it's a little bit more work. Uh, it, it does take a little practice as time goes on as far as continuing to do so and not letting uh, the slower courts uh, take your, your attacking attitude away. Uh, but as far as it goes, if, if you can do that and you can hold a firm grip and not be afraid of, of what you're facing out there, then I strongly recommend it. I use the drop shot to catch my opponent off guard. I take the racket back as normal, as I'm gonna hit a ground stroke or an approach shot. At the last minute on the follow through, I open my racket face a bit, so that as the ball leaves my strings, it has a bit of backspin on it and falls over the net with no pace. It's a difficult shot, one that requires feel and touch, but if you practice it, I know you can do it.
Well, there's a number of variations of uh, the volley. Number one uh, is the drop volley, which is a very, very delicate shot that is used only occasionally, I'm sure. It could be used as uh, the final shot of the point. Uh, it depends on where your opponent is. It also uh, should be used to catch him off guard a little bit uh, if he's expecting uh, something different. If you're at the net, he's going to expect the, the ball to come along towards the baseline. And if you can use a drop volley to catch him off guard, uh, catch him on the run a little bit, uh, and catch him out of position, you're lucky. Then on the other hand, if the drop volley is not perfect, uh, and it gives your opponent time to get to the ball, once he's there, uh, I think he can do most anything he wants with it, and uh, then you're on the defensive. So what I suggest is to grab onto the racket, but don't squeeze it too tight so that you have the opportunity to catch the ball out in front of you without losing control of the racket so the ball falls gently over the net. The lob volley is a very difficult shot. It's also a situation shot. If you're ever in need of a lob volley, this is what I recommend. One is to keep a very firm, solid grip on your racket, as you do on your volley. Make sure you catch the ball out in front of you. Now, on the other hand, your racket position should be a little bit more open to create an angle so that when the ball leaves your racket, it's able to go with some pace over your opponent's head as they're coming into the net. It's a very difficult shot, as I said. It's also a shot that I do not recommend, but if you're ever in need of it, it's worth a try. Well, the half volley can, uh, can be played from uh, the baseline and moving into the net at the same time. Uh, it's a very difficult shot to play, uh, especially uh, if you're serving and volleying uh, and the opponent gets the ball down low. You have to be able to catch the ball and, and uh, uh, play the ball over the net, get some good length on it so that your opponent can't take advantage of you. You're playing a, uh, a half volley from the baseline is difficult because uh, the ball comes deep. Uh, you're caught uh, in the middle. You can't move in and take the ball out of the air. You can't move back and, and let the ball bounce and, and rise so that you can take the ball uh, a, a split second later. So you have to more or less short hop the ball, whereas the ball is very low. Uh, and you have to come up on the ball so that you make sure you get some lift over the net uh, and deep enough so that your opponent can't take advantage of you. Then again, uh, on, the, uh, on the approach when you have to hit a half volley, you're moving in and the ball bounces, so your, your natural reaction is to, as you make contact, to pull up and to lift up on the shot, which does two things. One, it, uh, it, you're either going to lift up to the point of uh, pulling the ball down with your motion into the net, or two, you may lift up to the point of just not holding a firm enough grip on your racket to where the ball will sail past the baseline. Uh, if, if you hold the racket tight, if you try to stay low and move forward into the ball and continue moving forward to a, a good solid net position, I think you'd be a lot better off. One of the, the, the finest touch players uh, and shot makers that I've ever seen uh, and, and ever played against was uh, Ily Nastasi. He uh, had more shots and uh, more ability really than, than uh, anybody that I have ever seen play the game. Uh, any shot that uh, you can think of, I think he had the ability to play and I'm sure in some, uh, some time or some match in his lifetime he used them all. Uh, to watch him play was a thrill, and to, to watch the way he executed his shots, from drop volleys to lob volleys to drop shots to anything that you can think of was, uh, was a lot of fun for me, and I enjoyed watching him play. Okay, I use this shot. We'll call it the looper if you like. Uh, only occasionally, only when I'm out of position or the opponent hits a deep shot where I need time to get back into position and be ready to play the rest of the point. It's used to change the pace a little bit, to maybe catch your opponent off guard, but more or less to get back in position, get ready to play the point the way you want to for the rest of the action. Two things happen when you play this little looper. One is you're going to drop your racket head uh, so that when you come over the ball, remembering to follow through, you play with a little bit of top spin. Now as you do this, the ball is going to clear the net much higher. Also, when the ball bounces, 
with the top spin, it's going to continue to bounce and then jump a little bit higher, which gives you a little extra time. Let's we'll see if I can do it here. Not bad. Remember to follow through on this shot. If not, you're going to lift the ball a little bit too much and come over the ball too much to where the ball falls too short in the court, which will give your opponent the advantage to come in and take over the initiative. Remember to follow through and make sure to shoot for the baseline. There's another shot that, uh, that I've used quite a bit, and that's coming across the ball. Now that is more or less a, an outside in shot, but it's just more or less coming through and brushing across the outside of the ball, making the ball spin off my racket and stay low and bounce away from my opponent. Now this is a, a difficult shot at times and, and only used really when I'm out of position and, and the ball is very low coming to me, but it's one that's worked for me in the past. You might try it. It's very difficult to, to hit time after time, passing shots that are, that are going to be perfect uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, you're playing against a serve and volley player. He's always putting the pressure on you. He's getting to the net, so you're going to have to thread the needle, so to speak, time after time after time. Uh, another problem with the passing shots is you're hitting the ball on the run most of the time. So a lot of things come into, uh, into the view that you have to think about as you're hitting your passing shots. One, on the run, uh, make sure that your racket is back and you're moving in a way that you're keeping your body low so that when you make contact with the ball, you're able to lift the ball over the net. Now, down the line, you're going over the high part of the net. Cross court, you're going over the low part of the net, but you're hitting it into a greater amount of distance. So as you make contact and your follow through, make sure you lift the ball to the point of maybe putting a little bit of topspin on it so that you make sure that you're going to clear the net and also give your opponent uh, not that much time to, to react. Yvonne Lindell has another type of passing shot where he hits the ball very, very flat uh, in, in a straight line, so to speak, and the ball's coming at a, a little quicker pace. It's uh, difficult to, to read, it's difficult to get the jump on a passing shot like that, and you have to be very, very alert and, and feel that you can uh, close in close enough to cut the ball off and, and uh, make a good volley. Uh, on the other hand, uh, myself, I uh, hit passing shots in a different way. I hit with, uh, on the run, I hit with a little bit of topspin sometimes, uh, only for control, not in the dipping motion, and I don't hit them as flat maybe as a, as a Lindell does, but to the point where I have the pace and, and uh, the accuracy necessary to hopefully get the ball by you. Maybe it's not the right idea to go for the winner on the first shot. Maybe the idea is to play the first shot, uh, get him off guard a little bit, and then set it up for the second shot. Passing shots are very difficult. You're under pressure. You have to think of a lot of things in a hurry, and you have to execute them to perfection to get by with, uh, with hitting a winning passing shot. The women with, the, with the, the ground strokes are the ones that are going to pass the best. Uh, I should say uh, Steffi Graf in, in the past uh, year or so that she's been playing very good tennis has come up with some of the, the most exciting passing shots. Uh, Martina Navratilova with her athletic ability and, and the way she plays and uh, the way she's improved her ground strokes over the past uh, couple of years have, uh, uh, has made a believer out of a lot of the, the, the women players and, and the the fans in general that her ground strokes and her passing shots are, uh, are tops in the game also. Uh, doubles has come to the forefront in, uh, in the last five years. Uh, the money's become very big. 
Uh, plus, the amount of uh, doubles teams and doubles players there are is really, uh, really growing. Uh, to play doubles, I think you need a, a, a couple of uh, very sure things. One is to be able to play with someone who you enjoy playing with, uh, who you enjoy spending time with, so that your friendship can not only be off the court, but also on the court, to where you can be able to read a little bit along the way what each other is going to do. If you can find someone like that, I, th I think you're very lucky. As far as my doubles expertise, you may remember me as the one who served the ball and hit my partner Nastasi in the back of the head at Wimbledon a number of years ago. But doubles should be an enjoyable experience, one you can play at your own leisure. You have two sides, the serving side and the returning side. The server gets a high percentage of first serves in, gets to the net, and is aware and alert of what is to come. He also has a partner that is stationed near or around the net, hoping to be able to intercept the ball, hit it into the open court, and take advantage of any easy shots to come. The returner of the serve in doubles has one main objective, and that's to hit the ball firm enough and also keep the ball low enough to put the oncoming server in a defensive position. Now, he also has a partner that should be very alert and very aware of what is to come. Now, the net man on both sides, the returning side and the serving side, become vulnerable in a position like this as to hitting the ball at your opponent at the net is fair. Painful, but fair. So look for the high shot, Hit it at your opponent or into the open court and take your double seriously. You'll enjoy. It's important to warm up and loosen up your muscles at, at any time, but this morning it's a little bit on the cooler side, so it might be worth your while to take that little bit of extra time and go a little bit further to make sure that you don't get injured. A little bit of extra stretching and a little bit of extra movement before you go into your heavier exercise could be worth your while. I've always been one over the course of my career to, to walk out onto the court and hit for five minutes and uh, say serve them up and get right into the uh, into the practice, uh, whether you're playing sets or whatever, uh, I've learned now that uh, being able to, to go out and to stretch and to, to loosen up to the point of uh, getting warm and, uh, and working your muscles and not going into a practice or a, or a match cold is very, very important. Uh, I think, unfortunately, I might have learned that a little bit too late. I just learned that in the last couple of years and, and where stretching and aerobics and uh, and Nautilus have just become uh, really big time and very important. But I think for anyone to, to go out and to warm up and to loosen up and to, to feel that they're ready uh, and before they go into the tennis is, is uh, something that everyone should do. They should take their time, uh, know what's right for you, know the amount of time that it takes for you to loosen up and to warm up and to, to know your body well and then go out and, uh, and, and play your tennis, whether it's a match or it's practice, but then I think you'll get the full advantage out of your whole workout. Well, I've never really been one to, uh, to work with weights. I've always felt that uh, uh, what I got out of my workouts, uh, my on-court workouts and my off-court uh, was good enough. Uh, I also felt that, uh, that lifting the weights and, and building the muscle was uh, was bad for my tennis and bad for my type of game that uh, the the longer the muscles and the more uh, elastic my muscles would be the the better off i would be as far as playing my tennis so i i stuck more to or i still do more to maybe jumping some rope uh, being able to lift my feet uh, make sure that my my legs are in good shape and my feet are moving all the time uh, some jogging that uh, is good for uh, building your stamina wind sprints that are they're really uh, the important part of, uh, of my type of game. The, probably the maximum amount I run is 20, 20 yards at the maximum. So that is uh, the quick start and stop motion is very important to me. Uh, also maybe riding a, a stationary bike. 
uh, to the point of uh, working your legs, also working your heart and your cardiovascular to, uh, to build up your stamina in a way is good. Working out in anything you do is, um, uh, is really your own choice. Uh, you can change it daily, which is something that I do to avoid the boredom. Uh, I have drills that are, uh, that are good for my footwork to, uh, on the court, uh, where I run the lines uh, to make sure that I'm picking up my feet, that, that I'm staying in good shape, and that uh, I'm just working the whole court so that when I'm put in the situation, I feel that I have the ability to, to get to any, any shot that's, uh, that's played. Uh, then again, I don't want to bore myself on my time off, so it's good to, to make a change here, a change there. Maybe forget about working the court and and uh, and do something else for a day or two, just to to give your mind a rest, your body a rest, so that uh, when you do go back and do what's good for you and what you think is the best for your tennis, that uh, you're excited, your mind is right, and you can go about it in uh, with the right attitude. I, I don't know if uh, long distance running is is very good uh, for you, or what it does for your tennis. Uh, I know that uh, there there is a limit to to what one should do and, and what one should not do as far as what is good for, uh, for what they have in mind. Uh, I'm not a marathon runner. Uh, I don't intend to run a marathon, so for me to go out and run uh, nine or 10 miles a day was, uh, I think is uh, a little bit ridiculous. I think going out and running uh, two miles a day maybe or a mile and a half a day is, uh, is acceptable to the point of making sure that uh, uh, I am in shape uh, it does build your, your cardiovascular, it's good for my legs, uh, and it's good for, for what I need as far as my tennis goes. So uh, as long as one knows himself and what is good for, for he or she is very, very important and not to overdo it, I think is even more important. Practice is really where you learn the game. I think an hour to an hour and a half has always been plenty for me because I have put the, the maximum into my workouts uh, and also got the maximum effect, which is uh, once I finished playing for that hour, that hour and a half, I walked off and I felt complete that I've gotten the maximum out of my workout that I can, uh, and that's enough for me. Some guys go out, though, and, and have the ability to stay for four or five hours and, and practice and, and work in that time. Uh, for me, that's not good. I, I feel that I would waste too much time over the course of a four or five hour workout. So for me to go out and to play for an hour, hour and a half, uh, get the most out of it, uh, play the way I was taught, and then be able to do other things was very important. If I'm playing a match, my, uh, my practice sessions are very, uh, very short. I go out and, and just really to, to loosen up, to get a little bit of a sweat going so that uh, I can get my, my timing down, get my shots under control, and then go spend my time getting ready to play my matches. I do not want to leave my good tennis on the practice court. I want to save it for when I'm playing my matches. So a light workout is suggested, and then go in and play your matches the, the way you think is best. The reason I like this drill is because it puts me in match conditions. I place my opponent in one spot, and there I'm directing my play. I'm the one doing all the running. I'm getting the maximum, the maximum amount of exercise, and also hitting the maximum amount of shots. I can also move my partner up to the net, which gives me the opportunity to get the maximum again, <laughs> exercise and shots, but also having the opportunity to hit and practice my passing shots. This, for me, is one of the best drills. You try it, you'll like it also. If I have a week off in the middle of the year or whatever, I'll go out and spend 30 minutes on the backboard each day, uh, making sure that, that I do have the good, solid, basic ground strokes and, and everything that I need to have. That is where you learn how to play the game, I think, uh, is, is taking it back and, and stroking the ball. You know, you're never going to beat a wall. The wall is going to give every ball back to you so that you have to to do it. Now it's just a matter of if you do it right, if you have the basics down solid enough to that it's just a reaction. Take the racket back and swing nice and easy and fluid time after time after time. So if, if you have a wall or a backboard, you, that's all you need. It's better to practice a little bit extra on your weaknesses uh, and work a little bit on your strengths so that hopefully things meet in the middle to where your game is solid all the way around.
As you know, there are many different rackets, from mid-size to oversized. They also run in a different price range, from the lower end to the top quality racket. Uh, for those who are beginning, it might be better to use the oversized racket. You may find it easier to, to start and to play with. As you progress, stay with what you enjoy playing with, either the oversized or drop down to a midsize where you feel you have better control. It's your choice. You can do it. I probably used the, uh, the smallest racket on the market throughout my whole career. It was a, a metal racket that uh, today, in comparison, looks like a little squash racket. Uh, I used it because uh, I started using it because I liked the looks of the racket uh, about, uh, geez, I hate to say, 19 or 20 years ago. Uh, and I continued to use it because the, the racket seemed to fit my style. It, it seemed to fit the way I played, and it gave me the, the maximum amount of speed and, and usage of a racket that, uh, that I could find. The unfortunate thing on one side is that uh, uh, they quit making that racket. Uh, the fortunate thing on the other side is I, I got a little bit older and, and I wised up to the point of, of going to a mid-size racket, uh, a pro ceramic racket that uh, has helped my game even more so. And now let me explain that. Uh, the mid-size racket is a bigger face racket. It gives you a, a bigger area for, for striking the ball, also a larger sweet spot, which means that you, I have a larger area inside uh, the string frame of my racket to where I feel I can strike the ball and get the maximum uh, response. Keeping your racket in, in, uh, in good condition is, is as important as, as yourself being in good, good shape and good condition. Uh, your strings, uh, for instance, uh, from myself, I string my racket at uh, anywhere from 56 to 62, 63 pounds uh, with gut. So for me, I change my strings about every two matches or so so that I can continue to have the, the liveliness and the zest that, uh, that the strings supply to the way I hit the ball. Now, for you out there, I don't think that's, that's quite as important. I think that you can use your racket and your strings to the point of not letting them just wear out and wear thin, but to the point of, of whatever feels comfortable for you. Now, that could be two weeks, it could be five days. It depends on the amount that you play, how hard you play, how many balls you hit each day, and what response you want from your strings. So that is important for you to know and for you to find out for yourself. Also, a lot depends on the surface that you're playing on. Uh, if you're playing on clay courts, uh, the courts are a little bit slower. Uh, the balls become a little bit heavier due to the, uh, uh, to the particles that are picks, picked up. If it's rain, the balls become even more heavier. So uh, you have to string, as far as I go, string my racket a little bit uh, on the looser side so that uh, you have a little bit more play in your string so that the ball can carry a little bit further for you. Uh, on hard courts and indoors, I go up a little bit more on my tension, so I would probably string them on clay at 56, 57 pounds. Uh, indoors, I would probably go to 60 pounds because the ball would come through a little bit faster uh, on the indoor surface. It stays a little bit lower, uh, so I need a little bit more uh, resilience against the ball so that uh, when the ball comes off, I get, get a little firmer play uh, and lets the pace of the ball hit my strings and, and play it from there. And now on grass is a different story. Uh, you're not hitting that many shots. You're, you're returning the ball and, and the points go a lot quicker on the grass so I can afford to, to take my tension up even higher. So I would probably string my rackets uh, at 62, 63 pounds uh, and not worry about if the, if the strings break or not, having four or five extra rackets along the way. Uh, what I need on the grass is I need to know that once I make contact with the ball, uh, that the, the ball is going to zip off my strings and get the full amount of pace possible uh, due to the fact that I am expecting bad bounces. Uh, the ball stays very, very low, and I need to know that once I do make contact with the ball that I'm going to get the, the maximum amount of, of zip off my racket uh, at all times. Actually, the, the strokes that I've had throughout my whole career and, and from when I first started uh, blended in very well with the racket that I use now. Because of the bigger racket, I got by with a little bit more. I didn't have to hit the ball so perfect in the center of the racket like I used to. Uh, I also, if I was a half a step late or a step late, uh, the larger face racket let me get by with even more. I didn't have, because of not hitting it so perfect, 
I could just hold a tight grip and let the racket do a little bit more work for me along the way. So I think all in all, the going to the midsize racket has been the best thing for my game to the point where I feel that it's going to add longevity to my game and to my years of playing. Every time I step onto the, the tennis court, I, I play as if it's the finals of the U.S. Open uh, or a Wimbledon or any major event around the world. When you walk out for a match, uh, you have five minutes in the warm-up, and it, within that five minutes, one can tell more or less what is uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of, a, of your opponent. Uh, you don't have that much time, so you have to, to kind of catch on quick or use the first game or two of the match to... Uh, uh, as a feeling process, more or less like the, the first or second round of a, you know, of a boxing match to, uh, where a lot of jabs are thrown, but really uh, you're feeling out your opponent and you're not going to uh, go in for the knockout punch right off the bat. Uh, within these first couple games and including the warm-up, you, you should get a, a pretty good idea and a view of what, uh, what is to come over the course of the match and you should be able to adjust your game accordingly. A lot of times over the course of my career, I would uh, choose to receive where I felt it would give me an extra game to warm up, uh, my opponent's serving, and uh, if I'm lucky enough to, to start off fast and break his serve off the bat, then I feel that uh, I'm in the driver's seat more or less right away. Uh, lately, uh, I've begun to, uh, to serve first now to where I feel that if I jump off to a lead, I, I hold my serve, then I'm a game advantage all the time. Uh, as it gets later on into the set, say four games to three or five games to four, uh, there's a little bit more pressure on my uh, opponent to hold his serve so that he can stay in the, the set a little bit longer. Uh, really, it depends uh, on the individual. Uh, if you're, you're in there, you warm up quick, uh, it's better maybe to go ahead and serve and to try to jump off to that lead and to, uh, uh, to put the pressure on your opponent as, as the, the set goes longer and closes in on the important games. Whereas if you take a little bit longer to warm up, maybe use the first game as just that, uh, a warm-up game. And uh, then for, for when you do change sides and you start serving, you're down one game to love, but you feel more comfortable and uh, you can start off from that point. There are uh, a number of, of styles that uh, one faces as he, uh, as he plays uh, over the course of uh, years and years or over the course of a, of a lifetime. Uh, one is the serve and volley player and, and uh, how you handle that. Uh, for me, I, I enjoy playing against that style of player. It pits his, his strength, his serve and his volley against my strength, I would think, is uh, my return to serve. So the contrast in styles is very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, you, you may run into a baseliner who is uh, content to stay on the baseline, run down every ball, uh, just keep you out there for hours and hours and uh, hope to wear you down. Uh, on that hand, you must uh, think of a new plan, a, a new route to take as far as to disrupt his rhythm. Uh, is that to bring him into the net, to hit him some short balls, bring him into the net where maybe he doesn't feel comfortable? Or is it to be a little bit more aggressive yourself and to uh, hit the ball maybe with a little bit more pace and, and work it around so that you end up at the net taking the advantage that way? Uh, a lot depends on the situation. A lot depends on the feel, uh, the, the feel that you have for your game plus the feel that you have for your opponent's game. Uh, maybe it's better to use both uh, plans in the same match to, to mix it up so that uh, you can maybe keep your opponent off guard a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm only throwing out ideas here to you only because I'm not in that situation right now. Uh, I don't know how I would handle the situation until I was put there, just as, as maybe you wouldn't. So uh, these are my suggestions to you to, to work with and, and see if you can find one that you like. No day is going to be perfect all the time. There's always going to be uh, uh, ups and downs when you're playing the game of tennis. Uh, when you're struggling, whether it's on the volley or your ground strokes or whatever, uh, the most important thing is to, to have a, a regrouping plan, which means you can fall back on, uh, on something that, uh, on, on your ground strokes or your volley or whatever, that uh, can carry you through and win the match for you. I think that's one reason that, uh, that I stress the basics so very, very strongly, is that you can always fall back on whatever it takes to get you through the, the day, whether it's your ground strokes or your volley or your serve or whatever. And if you have a good basic foundation, uh, that's gonna come through for you. But 
one thing I want to stress here is even if you are having a tough day, don't get discouraged. I know that's a, a very difficult uh, uh, point to accept, but if you can fight through a tough day and get through it and, and feel satisfied when you walk off, then when you are playing well, you just feel that much more satisfied. As far as concentration goes, I possibly could be the worst subject of that, uh, only because I, I feel that uh, the less I concentrate over the course of a whole match, the better off I am. Now, let me explain that. I feel that it's better for me only to concentrate while the ball is in progress, the point is in progress, and the ball is in play, so that I get the maximum concentration out of the minimum amount of time. And once the point is over, I feel it's better for me to let my mind wander a little bit and carry on with the crowd or play with my strings or think about something else so that when the ball is, is once again in progress or the point is in progress and the ball is in play that I can donate all my concentration to that what's happening at the time. Uh, I don't recommend that. I recommend keeping your concentration throughout uh, the whole time if it's possible and if you can only because you don't have to focus in and focus out and then try to get back in that, uh, that concentrated uh, situation once again. Uh, once again, that's what's good for me may not be good for you. So it's, it's important for everyone on every level to find out uh, how they should handle every situation. And for concentration, I think that's one of the most important, so you should learn that very early. I've been very lucky uh, over the course of my career that uh, I haven't had any real major injuries. Uh, I've had a few uh, injuries here, a few there that have uh, kept me out of the game for a short period of time, but not, uh, not any that have, have uh, been devastating to my career. No matter what level you're playing at right now, whether you're a beginner, you're an intermediate, or you're an advanced player, please don't play injured. It's not worth it. Take the time heal correctly, then go back and play your tennis. You'll not only play better, but you'll feel better about yourself. It's very important just to, uh, to keep the court in your mind, to be able to go and to, uh, to strike the ball firmly and have the confidence to go for your shots uh, and not worry about anything, your opponent, uh, where he is, his position on the court, and most important of all, the court's not gonna move. It's gonna stay right where it is. So have the confidence, go for your shots, and it should be okay. There's two things that can happen when you're on the court. One, you're going to win, or two, you're going to lose. And neither one is really that drastic. So y the only problem is, is when you lose, you have to go and regroup a little bit to come back for your next match and be able to have the confidence in your game to, to bring it out again and to force the action and get in that same position again. The more you're in a position to win, the more and the easier it's going to be for you to close out those matches. Don't be afraid to go for your shots. Have confidence in yourself and your game and play it.